having established mindfulness to the fore, having connected with our training ground of the breath, the physicality of the breath right here in the body. The Buddha then suggests that we can sharpen the attention in a gentle way by being interested in the length of the breath coming in and the length of the breath going out. Because it's a very helpful barometer for the settling of the body and mind. Generally, with a more ordinary consciousness, the breath is relatively long. But as the mind and body settle, move towards samadhi, then the breath becomes more refined and shorter, but short in a refined, subtle movement. Now we're not trying to make anything happen. We're just adding to this general sense of breathing in and breathing out, a wholesome interest in the length of each inhalation, each exhalation, without trying to control this natural process of breathing. You could also say noticing the movement from a rougher, grosser breath to a more subtle, refined breathing. This is a natural, inevitable process when things settle down. So the Buddha is just inviting us to notice that settling from gross to subtle because the breath will reflect what's going on throughout the body and mind. So we'll continue now with some silence. Be willing to begin again and again.
Whenever there's some momentum, some continuity of present moment awareness, notice the inner pleasure of present moment awareness. The mind not so pushed around by the diversity of experience and instead just knowing this one thing, breathing in, breathing out, There's pleasure in this collectedness of heart and mind. This is a very powerful training to learn how to be interested in something that's ordinary and simple. Don't dismiss the practice because it's so ordinary ordinary and simple.
simply put, we're learning to seclude the mind, seclude the heart from all the comings and goings of the world by learning how to be interested in something ordinary, breathing in, breathing out, and to notice the settling process by seeing the breath go from being more gross and longer to becoming more and more refined, subtle, and shorter in terms of the length. And right there in the awareness of breathing in and breathing out, sense that subtle pleasure of seclusion. So we'll continue for another seven minutes or so.
Hello, everybody. Nice to be together this morning. Just take a moment and you might even feel whatever it is, but you might even feel some reverberation from that pleasure of seclusion that I mentioned in the guided instructions. And that's really the theme for the talk and our discussion today, um, because it comes right at the beginning of the Buddha's instructions for mindfulness of breathing, which you might think of as a preliminary set of instructions, but that's not it at all. It's really uh, the most complete map from tasting, initially tasting some pleasure of non-distraction all the way to full awakening. And there are 16 instructions and we'll be covering these now for probably a couple months. And I've just put into the uh, chat a link and there are a number of resources that you can check out. So you feel free to copy that link and then take a look later after the program today or put it uh, bookmark it. And I think Gabe Keller Flores, our office manager will be having that link with many resources for mindfulness of breathing um, in the weekly email and on the blog, on the website. So you have other ways to access it. For those of you who have time and interest and wanna really understand, this is how, even after the Buddha's awakening, this is how he practiced. So it's good enough for the Buddha, probably good enough for us. And of course, these different sets of instructions that the Buddha gave over the course of 45 years of teaching way back when, they're just different maps covering the same territory. So it's not like, well, I got to do this or should I do that? So, you know, part of it is just uh, when you're in a situation where there's a teacher teaching, then it's a good time to, okay, this may not be how I'm inclined to practice, but if I'm going to show up to this talk anyway, maybe I'll hear it and I'll check it out. And then that way, you know, even if it's not the primary map that we use over the years of our practice, it will really inform whatever map, whatever way of practicing that you do take up. There's nothing in these 16 steps that are sort of specific to the breath. In fact, the breath, the physicality of breathing in and breathing out as the primary object of awareness, that's only for the first two steps. And then after step one and two, which basically covered this morning in the instructions, the awareness of breathing in and breathing out in a sense falls into the background or the periphery of awareness. It's there. Awareness is aware that I'm breathing in or breathing out, but it's not in the forefront of attention like it was with the instructions this morning. And there's a very particular medicine that we're trying to access with these first two instructions. So the Buddha is saying, dear friends, there's this kind of a beautiful setting uh, where this talk was given way back 2,500 years ago or so. And the uh, nuns and monks had gathered as they did from time to time in larger groups. After um, the followers of the Buddha got pretty big, they, it got to be problematic because it was a wandering group. They weren't supposed to stay put as a way, as a mental training, because they'd get attached. The local people would really like the nuns and monks and, oh, please stay. And so the Buddha, the basic encouragement was just to keep wandering. You might stay for a few days, but then keep wandering. But the nuns and monks uh, caused damage to the crops because there were so many of them during the rainy time of year when they were planting and the plants were small. So the farmers asked the Buddha if they could just not do so much wandering during that time of the year, the rainy time of the year. So way back then at the time of the Buddha, it became the etiquette during the rainy season for about three months to stay put. So this is one of those situations where a large gathering of nuns and monks were staying put. And there were some teachers there, including the Buddha, some senior people in the Sangha 
including the Buddha. And the Buddha was giving a talk one morning and just feeling so much mudita, so much appreciative joy about how much progress all the people were making in their practice. And so the first part of the talk is just him doing riffs on how wholesome, how beautiful what's happening here is. And then he says, and I can offer you, you know, this summation, you know, so if, if you need more information, here's some more information. And that's when he gave this talk on mindfulness of breathing and invited everybody to stay longer so to practice together and to get instructions from the senior people in the community, in the monastic community. So they did. And so the first instruction is to find a quiet place, secluded hut, a big tree to sit underneath, compose your body in an upright way, in a stable way, and establish mindfulness to the fore. And basically for the first two instructions, you know, breathing in long, one knows I'm breathing in long, breathing out long, one knows I'm breathing out long, breathing in a short Shorter breath, one knows I'm breathing in a shorter breath. So of all the many, many things I could be paying attention to, there's this really powerful and beautiful resolve to just know this one thing. But it doesn't come from tension or a controlling tension. It's really more about this wholesome interest. Why not just let go of the whole world of what I might be thinking about, what I might be paying attention to, and just attend to the physicality of breathing in and breathing out clearly enough to recognize whether it's a rather, relatively long or short breath. So I can't just have a general sense that I'm breathing in and out. I need to be attentive enough to sense if it's a longer or a shorter breath. And you know, people can spend thousands of dollars on this biofeedback stuff. Maybe some people in the crowd this morning have done that. And it's neat stuff. I mean, I'm not putting it down. But we all have a built-in biofeedback mechanism because the body and the mind reflect each other. So when the mind, the heart begins to settle, gather, collect, right? This is what the word samadhi means. The mind, which is normally dissipated and scattered, because of our you know, reactions to each experience that's coming at us. I mean, we're bombarded by sense impingement, what we see, what we hear, what we think, what we feel, what we touch, what we smell, what we taste, literally bombarded. And each sense impression, the mind can help itself, but have some kind of reaction. I don't care about that, I'm gonna ignore it. I really like that, I don't like this. And with each of those reactions, it wants to continue to proliferate. What I talked about the last few weeks, papancha, mental proliferation. So this is just the destiny of a sensitive heart with a diversity of experience. We're going to be spun around, pushed around, ups and downs. This is our destiny for an untrained mind. So the, in spiritual practice, not just in Buddhism, but just generally any helpful spiritual system is going to have some way to collect the energies of the mind. What do you think drumming circles are about or chanting or prayer or any number of these sort of spiritual rituals that humans have been engaged in since the beginning of time? It's just something big, even storytelling around a fire, right? It's like whether we're going to find food tomorrow or not, leaves my mind because I'm just riveted to the fire and the story that's being told. So there have been since the beginning of time, rituals to help people touch into the pleasure of seclusion. That just means that the mind is temporarily letting go of being concerned about this and that. And the way it does that is it gets interested in one thing I think about a grandmother or a, a parent holding a, a child who's having a difficult time and crying and upset. And what do they, they rock the child, they give it a concrete experience. And if the rocking's not enough, they might sing or hum to the child. And it gives the child something very concrete to notice. 
in a sense, to distract it from what it might be causing it to get agitated. Take the mind off of what's triggering agitation and allowing everything to settle and soothe and gather and unify. Well, this is the beginning of these complete full path, beginning with tasting the pleasure, very real, subtle, but very real pleasure of seclusion, all the way to full, unshakable release of the heart, full awakening, these 16 steps. And the key, you know, as we go through them systematically over these next couple of months, is to get interested and to really, uh, even if it's just borrowed faith, check it out. That, that's that famous line from the discourses, ehi pasiko. It's like the most common line in the, in the di discourses. Please come and check it out. <laughs> that's such a practical invitation from the Buddha as a spiritual teacher, you know? Don't believe me. Don't believe what I'm saying is true. Check it out for yourself. And the whole, you know, the whole gist of the path is about becoming independent. Here's a really beautiful story. Some of you who are in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area, have come to the center, noticed on our altar in our med meditation hall, we have a statue of Mahapajapati. And uh, she is one of the awakened ones from the time of the Buddha. And uh, some of you know, at least as the story goes, the Buddha's mother died at childbirth. And so the Buddha was raised by his aunt, um, his mother's sister, um, Mahapajapati was her monastic name, because later after the Buddha's awakening, a few years after that awakening, he wandered through the place where he was born and several of his relatives uh, shortly after wanted to become part of the monastic Sangha, including his uh, aunt who raised him and some of his cousins. And so um, Mahapajapati was the first bhikkhuni, uh, ordained nun, and uh, many other women then ordained, which is a pretty radical thing at the time of the Buddha. Yeah, you know, more patriarchal than probably our society was. But uh, uh, they started a female sangha. And uh, once she came to the Buddha for some teachings, and uh, said to the Buddha, would you teach me the Dhamma, the teachings in a brief way, such that having heard these teachings from you, I might dwell alone, secluded, heedful, ardent, and resolute. And, you know, just because of the way things were, they'd get some teachings and then they'd sort of go off by themselves for much of the year in small groups maybe probably without a senior teacher there, but they've gotten some teachings and so they use them. So this was the teachings in brief then that the Buddha offered uh, this bhikkhuni, this nun, but just ha so happened to be the woman who raised them. He said to go to me, the qualities which you may know, these qualities lead to passion, not to dispassion, to being fettered, not to being unfettered, to accumulating, not to shedding, to self-aggrandizement, not to selflessness, <clears throat> to discontent, not to contentment, to entanglement, not to seclusion, to laziness, not to aroused persistence, to being burdened, to, uh, not to being unburdened. You may categorically hold this is not the path, this is not the training. So this is not, this is something we can understand, like in terms of getting independent and how to use these 16 instructions, because it's not about, um, it's like in order to really understand how to use an instruction, we have to be somewhat independent about what our heart actually seeks. And this list really helped. So I'm going to go through it in the positive way, because now the Buddha is going to say, and whatever qualities you may know that lead to dispassion, that lead to being unfettered, to shedding, 
to selflessness, to contentment, to seclusion, to aroused persistence, to unburdensomeness. This is the path. This is the training. So this inner sense that we want to develop about the uh, movement from reactivity and feeling contracted to the full, complete release, unfettered, unburdened, content. Uh, enlivened, right? So it's not like dead. It's there's something very awake, very enlivened, but simple. So this is, this should, when we reflect on what the Buddha said to go to me, Maja, Maja Pata Pati, uh, go to me is her family name, just like the Buddha's go to Ma, but the female members of that family go to me. So that, that was sort of the familiar name. Um, but this list will really help us and it will, it will be useful to hold this because we can get a set of instructions and get really neurotic about it and kind of run it through our ordinary mind, achievement, striving oriented mind and tie ourselves up into knots and wonder why things aren't happening for us and why somebody's further ahead in the path than me and, or whatever we might do with it, want to give up. I'm not good enough. I started too late in life. My mind's too active, too restless. I'm not really built for Buddhism. There's any number of ways to react to any set of instructions. So just to sense in your own life, this, what the Buddha calls the taste of freedom, the taste of release. Like we know what it's like when our heart, mind, body gets bound up, constricted. So what's the opposite of that? The unshakable release, releasing of any constriction. There's another teaching that I thought might be useful for us to reflect on as we're beginning the study of the Buddha's, it's called Anapanasati is the name anapana just means in and out breath so mindfulness of the in and out breath and that's just like i mentioned the frame for the buddha giving instruction for the whole path and there's another uh simple teaching i thought might be useful to reflect on and this comes from ajahn cha ajahn just means teacher he was a, a well-known monastic in the thai forest tradition and uh, an important teacher of some of our Western senior teachers like Ajahn Sumedho and Jack Kornfield and many others who had the good fortune to be able to practice with Ajahn Chah before he passed away in the 1990s. Um, but he, one teaching you hear a lot when you read the transcripts of the discussions and talks he gave back um, when he was still teaching was this metaphor, the simile of still flowing water. And he'd kind of make a joke of it. You know, still water, right? You've seen still water and everyone would go, yeah, yeah. Anybody seen flowing water? And then people would go, yeah, I've seen flowing water. You turn the faucet on or you watch a stream and you see the water moving, but sometimes you see something really still, body of water, like a mirror. Okay, I know still water, I know flowing water. And then he, this is the punchline. I mean, it's not really funny, but he thought it was funny. <laughs> but do you know still flowing water? You know, and, and then he'd go just right there, right? Kind of stops the mind, doesn't it? Like, what do you mean still flowing water? It's either still or it's flowing. So he'd use this image, this uh, metaphor of still flowing water for this uh, understanding, this path right, from complexity and reactivity to something still, something really simple. Some of you might get the uh, Saida Utejaniya, uh, some of you know Doug McGill. He teaches, usually we get him up to teach once a year at Common Ground Meditation Center. He's been for many, many years now the 
um, main teacher at the Rochester Meditation Center here in Minnesota. And, uh, and he runs the daily Utejaniya, which is, uh, Saida Utejaniya is a Burmese monk. And he has a little quote that gets sent out to an email list every day. I think there are thousands of people on that email list because Saida Utejani is a very popular teacher that both Wen and I have had the privilege to study with. And I think it was today, maybe yesterday, the quote that got sent out to that email list, the answers to our problems can be found in our own mind, in our own heart. We must find a still point that is not dependent on anything for our happiness. We must find a still point, or you could substitute the word, we must find the released point. We must find the release that is not dependent on anything for our happiness. And in a way that release, that stillness, that freedom, that intuition that there is freedom, there is release, it's kind of like our birthright, but that doesn't mean it's obvious or that we've realized it. But we might sense, like, because we know the opposite of release, of stillness, we, we know what it's like to be spun around, pushed around by life, the ups and downs, our hopes and fears, right? Anybody not know that? We really know that experience. But we don't maybe directly, immediately know the absence. And a lot of times then we misunderstand the path because we know the problem is getting spun around and getting tight about that. So we imagine that the relief comes when I don't have a world. I don't have a body. I don't have the complexity of friends and partners and I don't have a messy world with all the suffering and injustice. I'm out of it. Ah, ease. And this is why it's good, especially when the first two instructions are just about seclusion, where we are sort of stepping out of the complexity and just being with the breath. It's good to get the teaching right from the beginning of our digging into the Buddha's 16 steps on mindfulness of breathing that the aspiration is really stillness in activity right so stillness in the complexity of having a life having relationship in a world that's calling for our engagement asking for help basically right not asking for us to sort of run away i mean we get if we're lucky, if we have good fortune, we have moments where we can turn away from our duties and responsibilities toward the suffering in the world. So that when we come back into the activity of life, the complexity of life, we have more of that intuition of what it means to be still, what it means to be released in the middle of activity. And a lot of helpful stories and teachings in spiritual life really like the whole trajectory is using seclusion to better understand the nature of the mind, but then always getting drawn back into the world. It's like, how does that insight show up when I have responsibilities? Oh, I'm tasting, I'm feeling a lot of equanimity, a lot of peace. What is it like? What is that peace? What happens to that peace, that space, that non-aversion, non-fear? What, is, what happens then when I'm back in the messiness of life? Does the fear come back? Oh, well, yeah, it does. <laughs> well, how might I be able to maintain that sense of stillness, simplicity, peace, non-fear, love, even when I'm in the middle of really horrific things, doing my best. So the, in, in this long 
path of awakening. And it's, I think, useful to have a really vast view. But even though it's vast, it doesn't mean that we're not in moments really practicing at this end point, which is realizing that non-fear because of that sense of emptiness, stillness, or release, so that we have different words we use in the Buddhist tradition that just point to that experience that there's no problem here. So we might in some moments be practicing right in the middle of hell, right in the middle of complexity, but really being grounded to some degree, at least in that sense, it's okay. And we might have a lot of emotions even getting triggered. That's okay too. And the people around us might have a lot of not so skillful emotions too, but there's some, something quite alive and trustworthy that isn't having a problem with life in its messiness. But it's important also, so just because we're going to emphasize this beginning part of the path at the next few weeks, I don't want to pretend that there won't be moments we're practicing being an enlightened being, let's just call that, right? right? Where, where we're able to manifest to some degree being awake and unafraid and free even in the difficulty of life. But let's come back and spend the last few minutes today just really talking about um, and reflecting on the pleasure of seclusion so that we can develop this competency, this spiritual competency. Does my heart know how to access the pleasure of seclusion? That's a nice way for you to come back to this part of the spiritual life. Does this heart, this mind, know how to access the healing pleasure of seclusion to go from distractedness to the very real but subtle pleasure of simplicity of feeling gathered and unified and so we can just uh, use these first two instructions from the buddha the beginning point the buddha makes is just to establish mindfulness to the four and realize that the body is breathing in and out. And then the second part is simply using the breath as a biofeedback mechanism. And so sharpen the attention enough to notice the length of every in and out breath, always teasing out any neurotic effort to think I need to control my breath. And for some of us, some of the more type A people in the crowd, that's gonna be a chronic problem that what we pay attention to, we feel we need to control. Some of you who have partners know this. (laughs) You watch, you observe your partner. It's hard to observe your partner without having opinions, let alone everybody else on the planet. Even your pets, you know, oh, that's not the way to use the litter box, right? We have, it's just hard for us to observe without feeling like the world needs us to control and manage for some of us more than others, for sure. Well, you might notice that tendency with your breath, being aware of the breath. So just keep bringing in that kind instruction, honey, it's okay to relax. Any, uh, any sense of you needing to do this isn't gonna be helpful right now because the breath fortunately can come and go as a bodily function. It doesn't require uh, mental oversight. I mean, we can mentally control the breath, of course, but for this practice, it's not about mentally taking charge of the breathing process. We want to actually observe the breathing process as a natural process happening as you know, just part of the bodily system. Breathing in happens, breathing out happens. Sometimes it's rough. Sometimes it's smooth, sometimes it's long, sometimes it's short. But because the bodily activity reflects what's going on in the heart and mind, as the mind goes from being scattered and dissipated towards samadhi, that unification, that subtleness, 
then the breathing process is going to reflect what's going on in the mind. So generally, you can't force it. It's not our job to force it. But generally, you'll see that the breath is going to go from rough and gross and long to short, refined, and subtle. And we really want to notice that because it, it's how the mind learns feels empowered, I know something about accessing the pleasure of seclusion. This is a healing pleasure. I feel empowered. I know how to find that again. So when my mind, I've had a bad day and I've gotten really attached and spun around, pushed around by life, and I feel the ill effects of my body and mind from that, I know what to do. Find a relatively simple environment and withdraw the mind. Use some aspect of the present moment reality, like my breath, and gather all the energy of the mind in that activity until I start to feel the pleasure of that simplicity. It's not so much the breath provides the pleasure It's the no longer being pushed around by the diversity of experience because all that has retreated into the background. And what's in the foreground is the ordinary experience of breathing in and out and the pleasure of how simple everything is right now, how secluded the mind is right now from everything else. So it's available and it's just a matter of developing that spiritual or mental muscle and whatever we're you know wherever we begin like being a relatively scattered distracted human being let's say just so happens that everybody on the call right now in the zoom room right now we represent the one percent of the most distracted scattered human beings on the planet but it doesn't matter because all of us can move from what our habit is to developing the habit of unification. And if for whatever reason, using the breath as an anchor isn't useful, like maybe a few of you have had a lot of health problems around your breath, bad asthma, for example, or something like that, there might be just a lot of emotional baggage around the breathing process. No problem. Because there, any ordinary experience will do. The breath is nice because it has this biofeedback, you know, because it's a dynamic process, it changes as the whole body and mind settle. But you could just use whole body awareness. That would be another just sort of default anchor to use. Just use the totality of the experience of the body sitting. And the breath can be there, but not in the forefront of attention. Some of you hopefully will um, be able to stay on. I think Nancy's here today to lead uh, and organize the small groups in a moment. And uh, what I recommend, whether you're able to stay for the small group discussions that last about 15 minutes or that doesn't make sense for you, but find a time either on your own or with a good Dharma friend or stay and join the small groups of three or four and talk about what you've learned over the course of your practice, that whole spectrum from when you're not secluded and your mind is definitely sort of that vigilance, noticing this, noticing that, and the reactivity that comes from feeling responsible for everything that's coming and going in your experience. And when you've tasted how you've tasted seclusion, And remember, it might have been when you were knitting. It might have been when you were petting your dog. It might have been when you were walking in the woods where your mind really naturally gathered and it was just in that activity. It might have been when listening or playing music. Or maybe you were in one of those drumming circles, (laughs) right? Or doing some of the chanting. These are, or prayer. But It's nice with a friend who's sort of got some practice uh, experience too, to talk out loud and to learn from each other about this movement from distraction to 
the pleasure of seclusion. And then specifically how you might use something like the breath to really facilitate that learning, how to go from distraction to the pleasure of seclusion and really having a visceral sense of the pleasure of seclusion. So this is a theme you might use for the small groups today. Of course, anything that seems relevant to what, how you're using your practice is a good, you know, these small groups that we have that Shannon and Nancy help organize at the end of the Sunday morning. It's appropriate to bring up really anything related to practice, but it's nice for us to kind of develop the theme together. And then, like I mentioned, there, there's the resources that you can check out. And here at the beginning of the year, there are many things starting up. So there's a Buddhist studies class starting for eight Mondays, starting tomorrow night, that I'll be teaching on mindfulness of the body, embodiment. People are welcome to join in for that. Please sign up. And then on Tuesday night, two things are happening. Jean Haley is going to be joining that Dhamma Among Us. That's that Tuesday evening program that Shelley and Patrice um, MC where they're inviting in a diversity of voices in different ways the practice is showing up. And Jean, one of our regular Dharma teachers, is going to be teaching about money and relating to money in terms of our practice. But I'll also be starting a six-week introduction class on Tuesday evenings. Still plenty of space. If you know anybody or if you yourself would be interested in that refresher course, just sign up for that Tuesday evening class. Shelley, of course, will be doing her their normal teaching on Wednesday night, the Wednesday evening practice group. Uh, Shelley and I will be doing a two-day online retreat over President's Weekend. It's actually the Friday before President's Weekend in the middle of February and all day Saturday. So all day Friday, all day Saturday. And of course, many other things coming up. I think we're still looking for a few people to help out with the snow team, people who live in the area, Minneapolis area, who can help shovel and use our snow beast. We have a powerful snow machine, um, snow blower. So if you're able to do that, let the center know and Gabe will connect you with Rob and the other people on the snow blowing team. And really nice to be with everybody this morning. I'll go ahead and uh, make Nancy Bowler, one of our longtime teachers, yoga teachers, the host. So Nancy can organize the small groups. But if you don't want to stay along for the small groups, you can say goodbye now. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.